I get mixed feelings when my doctor says, let's have a phone or a Zoom appointment. Um, relief that I don't have to go in, but apprehension about the quality of care. How is you going to tell exactly what I'm suffering for, from and can they actually see what I'm going to be describing? I'm fortunate and privileged to have a phone and access to the internet, but some people don't. That conundrum that I get into, the happiness of not having to go in and the sadness of the quality of care is going to be answered by the question from our, ne from our next panel, which is titled Help or Hindrance. What potential do ADTs have to address the inequities of healthcare in Canada and around the world? It is led by Josephine Wong. Josephine is a professor and research chair in urban health at the Daphne Cockle School of Nursing at Toronto Metropolitan University. At Bridging Divides, she's the core lead for the immigrant health and well being theme and a member of the place and infrastructure theme. Over to you, Josephine. Um, as Martha said, I hope you had an excellent lunch. Uh, I'm Josephine Wong, and I have the pleasure to co-chair this roundtable that is semi-circle, semi-circular with Georgiana, who is there monitoring what is coming in from uh, the, our online audience. And I'm just going to uh, say a couple of things to kind of set the context for our um, panel here, and then I'll introduce our esteemed colleague here. So how many of, if you do not have a mobile cell phone, put up your hand. Aha, uh -huh. I only know one person in my life who doesn't, and he insists that he's not gonna get one. And so digital technology is actually today. Uh, recently, I was in a conference in one of the mid-sized city in Ontario, and one of the participants actually fainted. That center, the conference center had no <laughs> blood pressure cups. They had nothing to find out how that person uh, was. And one of the physicians who was a participant actually took out her very expensive digital personal device and was able to actually measure all kinds of stuff. So those type of things are happening. At the same time, I also want to point out that since all of you have cell phone, there are no phone booths out there. That's probably the reason why we don't see Superman or all those people appearing. And think about it. If you lost your cell phone and you really need to call home, how would you do that? And do you think that you ask someone to lend you their cell phone, you will, people will lend it to you? And do you think every person who asks someone to borrow the cell phone would actually receive that kind of courteous? So that kind of set the context. And the other thing is a lot, of, we talk about a lot of things about AI, and we talk about human resources displacement. It's not only human resources. How many of you had heard of Balto? Put up your hand if you had heard of Balto. That was an, a dog in Alaska in 1925 who actually had traveled 600 miles to deliver life-saving medicine. And today we do it by drones. So I think some of us need to speak out for our dogs. So on that note, I'm going to introduce our esteemed um, colleague here. So next to me is uh, Elizabeth Sewick, who is from UBC and who is co-chairing our health and wellness uh, theme in Bridging Device. And he is di she's director of a center that she had actually started and is continuing to collect all kinds of um, data, which I guess had to use digital technology, some part of it and is there to actually address um, health equity for very systematically marginalized youth. Then next to Elizabeth, um, I have here Andre, and Andre, I gotta find the page. The digital wouldn't help me, I had to use paper. <laughs> so Andre Redzantoho is the inaugurated professor of humanitarian development studies in Western Sydney University. He is also a public health research 
uh, researcher specializing in global migration, health equity, and cultural competency in healthcare. Next to Andre uh, is Mala Assis, and she is the director of the Scala Brittany Migration Center specializing in international migration, social transformation, and migration governance. And then next to um, Mala is uh, our new colleague at uh, TMU. Uh, she is the new CERC chair with the Faculty of Community Services. And she is a leader in international uh, studies of disabilities, marginalization, and global inequities. She joined TMU from Western Sydney University. So you can see here that in this semicircle, one of the common uh, interests and passion of all of us is actually on health equity. And so the first um, comment or question that I'm going to pose to all our esteemed uh, scholars here is actually for you to share your program of research so that we understand where you're coming from and what does it have to do with migration, digital technology, and health equity. Starting Anyone. with me? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so as, as Josephine mentioned, I'm um, in addition to being the director of the School of Nursing at UBC, I lead the Stigma and Resilience Among Vulnerable Youth Center. And so this is a center that focuses on adolescents and young adults. And while much of the work doesn't necessarily solely include migrant youth, a key focus of our research is how stigma, discrimination, trauma, and violence influences the health and health behaviors of young people and what protective supports in their relationships, in environments, in policies and programs can help address that and promote health and reduce some of those health inequities. And while some of those groups that I work with include 2SLGBTQ plus young people, young people who are homeless or precariously housed, indigenous young people, it also includes refugee and migrant young people and the intersection of those groups as well as um, racialized young people across Canada, across um, Europe, actually really in a, most places of the world, we have collaborators that are doing this work. So much of our research in terms of thinking about how does digital technologies get involved with it, some of that is actually because teenagers are some of the folks who grew up with digital technology from day one and, um, and have a, a really engaged, um, almost ubiquitous in relationship with their phones or their other tech. And, and in fact, as we're seeing some additional um, like school districts or, or governments trying to limit people's access to smartphones in the classroom, um, that creates some really interesting challenges, as any of you who may have lost your phone, as Josephine said, um, just how much is an extension of us as adults? It's like magnified to 11 for young people. So some of the research that we do actually looks at how they engage with social media and digital technology and, and taps into things like experiences of um, violence that are now new because of digital technology. So not just bullying, but cyberbullying, not just dating violence, but digital dating violence, or some of the other ways that technology can be used to stigmatize, marginalize, or um, be violent with others. Some of the technology is also what we're taking advantage of in, in doing research with young people. So we advertise for some of our interventions through social media less so now because um, some of the, the marginalized groups that we've been able to reach out to, you can't reach them that way anymore with some of the, the new rules and some of the social media, or we end up actually reaching a lot of other people who want to break the research or want that extra incentive, and so they aren't necessarily who they say they are. But we also use these kinds of, of online and digital technologies to engage marginalized populations who haven't always had a voice. 
Um, we're creating youth advisory councils to guide our research that no longer are just in Vancouver and Toronto and Montreal because that's where the universities are that the research is being done, but actually can tap young people in Salmon Arm and Terrace, far northern and remote and rural parts of our provinces to be part of the work where they may be like the only migrant gay South Asian kid in their neighborhood or their small town. So this is an opportunity for us to get their voices and hear their concerns and, and have them be involved in the research. But technology is also what we use to then um, engage with them, both um, in disseminating that research and in conducting that research. We now can do surveys where you can toggle between different languages that we program in without having to actually send out 27 different copies of that youth health survey to the public health nurse when she goes into the school. So, so these are ways that technology is part of our research in addition to understanding how um, that technology is, is being taken up by young people. We're also using some of those same features in health promotion interventions, um, where we're using text messaging interventions with young people who are not easily located in, in typical places. Um, so so this, is, this is one of the things. I, I do want to, to mention that most of what we do um, is focused in the broader community and not necessarily just in clinical settings or healthcare because as a public health nurse, my background basically has identified that most of health impact is actually from where we live, work and play and not where we actually get healthcare or those treatments or those medications. Those contribute, but a lot of people can't even access healthcare. So a key part of my work is actually before you get to that clinic or that hospital space and the technology that might be used there. Yeah, so my name is Andre. I'm from Western Sydney, in, uh, Western Sydney University in, in Australia, in Sydney, beautiful city and warm. And, but far away, yeah. you go there, make sure you build in two days to, to recover because it's too far away. So <laughs> my research focuses on understanding determinants of health inequities among immigrants uh, in Australia and try to understand what kind of initiatives can be put in place to reduce or to bridge the gap in, in, in health inequities. And I'm going to talk maybe using an example of the COVID-19 response to try to highlight some of the issues, which then I will elaborate on further on. So when you look at during the pandemic, uh, Australia, Canada, USA, the system really was uh, reconfigurated so quickly and made it so agile to be able to incorporate ADTs such as you know, uh, contact tracing, um, such as te telehealth, uh, data sharing, et cetera. This is fantastic. The system is agile, but they left a big chunk of the population behind, the migrant population. And when they leave them behind is because when you look at all the data during COVID, I don't know in Canada, but in Australia, the data really, they don't look that really appealing. So migrants were more, especially African and Middle Eastern migrants were more likely to test positive and to report more symptoms. They were more likely to, um, to be hospitalized and to experience the severe effect of COVID infections. They were more likely uh, to, ex to, ex uh, to, to, uh, to display vaccine hesitancy and uh, um, you know, uh, low uptake. And more importantly, they had, they had the highest COVID mortality ever recorded in most OECD countries. So migrant, Middle Eastern migrants in Australia, the COVID mortality was six times higher than the national average. And among African migrants, it was almost 20%, but that, uh, sorry, around 8% higher, but that is where things become really complicated. Australia doesn't collect data on ethnicity, it doesn't collect data on race. And we are learning ancestry data which are useless, which then, when you look at the sub-Saharan sub African migrants, 
the majority, 60%, are white Zimbabwean, white South African who come to Australia, 60%, who are better off socioeconomically than Australian born. So the data really are, the data among sub Saharan African are being conflated or even being um, not showing the true trend because of the white South African and the white Zimbabwean. Now, what happened then? Why did we record that level of really, uh, inequities in COVID outcomes? Despite wonderful uh, innovation, ADTs, uh, you, you name them. This is because the government never took care of what I call the social determinant of technological, um, um, of digital technology uptake. And it's not social determinants of health, but the social determinant of digital technology uptake, which are go hand in hand. So what are they? Usually when we talk about ADTs, we look at them as one object we are going to, trans to transplant into, uh, into another. But don't forget that they need to be implemented in existing systems. So if those systems had already experiencing inequities, ADT are going to amplify or even exacerbate them. That's the case. So which meant then, when you look at the social determinant for ADT among uh, African and Middle Eastern migrants in Australia, there were, there were around two factors. One which was a system level, what I call unconscious bias and discrimination. We had what we call infodemics, which were very ripe there. And we had what we call digital exclusion, which were complementary in one way or the other. So as a system level, what were they? Number one, already African and Middle Eastern migrants were underrepresented in all community-based interventions. So br bringing in ADTs, confirm them even out, outside the, those interventions, which means they were not participating. The government never invested in uh, consulting those communities to try to see whether the content to be produced and disseminated through any technological transform uh, uh, intervention could reflect their needs, which meant then everything was not a mismatch. They were, they were not interested in, in being involved. When you look at the translation of material, they translated few languages, and that was a direct English to community language translation, no cultural adaptation. They were, even those people who spoke the language were lost in translation. And the level of inaccuracy was very high. So it doesn't matter how much you disseminate that information using technology, digital technology, if the content doesn't resonate with the community, if the content with translation is flawed, is not accurate, the community are not to be engaged. Then most of them deliver to call public housing. I'm pretty sure in Canada we have public housing. And public housing, the small houses. When you look at African and Middle Eastern, the average size is 5.8 children per, per woman, com compared to 1.2 um, on Australian born. So which meant then the houses are so small that they can't even house the whole family member then you ask them to be able to have enough space for a computer, for an internet cable, for so which means the environment is not enabling for them to have all the tools required to, act, to adopt and uptake uh, any digital technology. Then we had what we call um, uh, racial profiling and the heavy policing handling of migrants where even though the outbreak will come from rich suburbs, but as soon as they hit the poor suburbs, there was a heavy presence of the government was sending police in those public housing, and uh, the present police was really threatening in those housing, which meant then all of a sudden showing that if you are an African or a Middle Eastern migrant, you were stopped and searched 2.5 times frequent, more frequently than any other population, uh, any other Australian born, which meant then if you had your mobile, they suspect your mobile, you're using it to, to conduct AI, to conceal illegal activities. So they would search, confiscate your mobile applications, and that was threatening, which meant then that became a disincentive for them to use that. Then when you look at uh, um, the, the other, the infodemic now, the infodemic happens in two, in two ways. So there's what we call the misinformation. So misinformation, which is an intentional transmission of false, uh, false facts, such as rumors, but the most damaging one was disinformation, which is the intentional communication of false information with intention to harm. So which meant because they couldn't afford, uh, they didn't have adequate access to digital technology, they relied on a, on a free 
communication uh, app, such as Messenger and WhatsApp, which meant then all the information they got were for family members in country of birth who are illiterate, who have a low health literacy, don't understand anything about COVID, that became their main source of information about COVID prevention. Now, which meant then they were not exposed to the true, updated, accurate information, and they were relying on real information that would never stand up on two legs as far as uh, accuracy of information was concerned. So those became the, the biggest driver that really, later on, I may elaborate on, that drove those, um, those inequities. And as I'm saying, for me, I'm looking at it from the system within which ADTs are implemented, rather than looking at ADT as drivers independent of the system in which they're operating. Hello, good afternoon. Um, in my case, uh, I work mostly on the issues of migration policies and migration governance in Asia. And I would just like to mention at the very outset that the context is very different. No? Uh, international migration is taking place in a very significant way in Asia, within the region, to and from the region. But I guess the most important one is temporary labor migration. And it is a kind of migration that is quite different even from the temporary work program of Canada because there is no pathway to residence. So the, 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 the temporary labor regime that we have in our part of the world is something that is really based on the notion that people should not be staying in the destination countries for good. There is no pathway for residence. And this holds true for those workers in low wage, um, uh, low wage employment. Um, so while, while the fact is that, you know, there's a lot of um, international labor migration that happens within the region, but the majority of workers that move within the region are also in lo low skilled categories. And um, because of the general policy framework, uh, that they're only there temporarily, they're only there to work for a specific sector, it's not easy for them to transfer employers if the conditions are very difficult. And so um, the, the, the social context in which they work is already very, very difficult to begin with. And so it's not very unusual to find, therefore, that um, migrant workers find themselves in vulnerable situations and risky situations when it comes to health issues. And so when the COVID-19 pandemic happened, uh, it only really confirmed what we had suspected all along, that migrants' health is not really of importance to the countries of destination, okay? Uh, that migrants' health is something that uh, is not really a priority. And in fact, what the pandemic also showed us is that aside from the fact that migrants' health is not a priority, but really the fragility of social protection. So there was a huge uh, social protection gap. And one of the... Uh, one of the conclusions that um, a lot of the reflections about what the pandemic uh, revealed to us about the situation of migrant workers in the region is that social protection is based on uh, the idea of deservedness rather than on the idea of protection rather, on, rather than on the idea of need. Okay. So uh, what happened, therefore, actually, uh, there were also, I guess, some silver linings that we can see uh, as far as uh, the impact of the pandemic is concerned, because on the one hand, it did um, jumpstart governments to really go digital and also to adopt technology. And one example of that is the Philippines. No? So there were many processes, um, especially um, with the repatriation part and also um, in managing the system that uh, led government agencies to really adopt technology and something that should have been done a very long time ago. And in some ways also during the pandemic because uh, migrant workers, when they returned to the Philippines in very large numbers, uh, they were also quite empowered with the use of technology that they can also voice out their concerns and what was happening to them during the repatriation process. So that happened in a very significant way. And even in the way that we practice research, I think um, um, speaking of a very personal experience, uh, during the pandemic, it was really, I, I found myself really in a very difficult dilemma. It's like, 
how can we do research at this time when, you know, like the whole world is suffering? And um, do I still have the energy to keep on interviewing people? And, uh, you know, uh, all those kinds of questions. And then it occurred to us that maybe what would be useful is to actually use um, some of our research findings to help um, migrant workers and their families cope with the pandemic. So that's when we also started, as far as our research practice is concerned, in terms of research dissemination, we, uh, we embarked on a series of webinars uh, to help uh, migrant workers and their families cope with the pandemic. So we had a session on devoted to the children of migrants. We had a session devoted to migrants who returned home. And then also in addition to uh, providing some psychosocial support, we also provided information about uh, um, you know, some of the options that they can have, uh, like livelihood uh, options and then programs of the government that they can access uh, the, to, to help them out during the crisis. Um, I think what I also like to mention here is that um, maybe it does not really concern just the migrants in uh, specifically, but Andre's comment about social determinants also um, uh, reminded me of um, a finding that, uh, uh, a finding from several studies in the Philippines that during the pandemic, there was indeed an increase in the use of telehealth and telemedicine, okay? Uh, but was, what, what was quite interesting, however, is that this idea of introducing telehealth and telemedicine was intended to increase access to health services by people in the rural areas. But uh, what the data did show, however, is that uh, indeed there was um, an increase in the use of telehealth services, but the usage was more by people from the urban areas. And that's because people in the urban areas had better access to um, better model phones, smartphones. They also had um, more access to stable internet connections. Uh, and so infrastructure was a big part of it. And, and so, yes, indeed, you know, the technology can be there. But then if there are conditions also in communities, in countries that do not enable people to be able to have access to uh, this uh, technologies that can be quite helpful, then there are some limitations. I'd also just like to mention that uh, also in the case of, um, in the case of Asia, uh, there are origin countries and there are destination countries. And on the part of origin countries like the Philippines, there's also a lot of concern about the health and well-being of the families left behind. You know? As I mentioned at the very outset, because the, temp, uh, because the migration regime is based on temporary labor migration. So it creates this phenomenon of migrant workers and their families being separated from each other for quite an extended period of time. You know, the rise of what we know as transnational families, but the rise of such transnational families is something that's not out of their own choice, but because the policies don't allow migrant workers and their families to be together. And so um, a big part also of the work that we do in the center is also looking into the health and well-being of the children and the families left behind. Um, we've been part of a longitudinal study that was started in 2008 and which was coordinated by the National University of Singapore. So uh, four countries in Southeast Asia and then a second round of study that was conducted in 2017 and the third round was in 2023. And I guess just as a preview, indeed the pandemic has, uh, I think really created um, mental health issues because in the earlier waves of studies that we have done, um, there were not um, remarkably, you know, um, um, no noticeably a sizable proportion of people who, uh, reported mental health issues, but then with a pandemic, sorry, uh, at least based on the preliminary data that we have gathered so far, uh, there seems to be an increase in people reporting uh, on mental health issues. So I think I'll stop at that for now. Hello, um, thanks so much for having me here today and inviting me to this panel. Um, so to be quite honest, I'm probably the outlier of the panel. I'm technically a disability scholar whose work intersects around the social determinants of health and well-being 
or how I think about really the way in which disability is created through active practices of denial, uh, misrepresentation, discrimination, exclusion, and dis uh, discrimination. So where a health issue actually becomes uh, a disability because they've been denied access to care. Um, and care, I conceptualize very broadly in terms of infrastructures of care, and in particular, coming back to the role of the state. And I guess why I was invited this afternoon is because primarily my work in relation to um, migration is thinking about eugenic science and how eugenics really becomes a core and has maintained its value um, in sorting through bodies, bodies of value that um, enable entry or are denied entry in the migration process. Um, so i thinking about, when I think about migration and I'm thinking about bodies and mobility, I'm thinking about the role of ideology, the role of state power, and the types of state practices and infrastructures that will deny, stigmatise, or enable bodies to move across borders, and what that actually might mean once they have landed, wherever that may be, whether that's a second country, a third country, or a fourth country, being Australian uh, from uh, diaspora parents from the former Yugoslavia or Croatia, that also means in the Australian case, you could end up in a refugee camp outside um, of, of an excise zone. So uh, making that trip might create disabilities. And when you actually, if you ever get out of a camp um, that has been contracted by the Australian state, if you didn't have a disability before, you definitely have one now because of the level of state violence that is put upon those bodies. And then thinking about the role of health service providers who are in those roles and who service uh, refugee and uh, refugee camps in excise territories, and not, you know, they the kinds of moral dilemmas in which they engage with about, um, you know, am I protecting these bodies by being a worker here, or am I implicated in sustaining uh, their um, position of statelessness and dispossession? So coming from a disability angle, we're thinking about these things, about um, bodies of value, bodies of productivity, the way that which embodies are not only uh, racialized, but in ways in which notions of productive power are absolutely critical to migration practices, such as worker programs. Um, the way in which I come to uh, digital technology is really um, partly through that process but also partly through, um, I kind of got a little bit tired of doing um, what many of my friends outside academia would say, depressing research. Can't you research something fun for a change? Why are you always telling us about the bad things the Australian state does to minority and dispossessed bodies? It's like, oh, okay, what am I gonna do? Anyway, in the hallways, there was a, um, a digital guy who was at one stage an entrepreneur, uh, then sold it and bought a jazz bar. That went broke and he ended up in academia. He started up a run club and we found that there were a couple of us who, you know, joining academia was about our fourth or fifth or in my case, seventh career. So we just decided we had some affiliation um, around actually not being academics really at all. Um, and we started up a project um, in Western Sydney. Uh, those who don't know Western Sydney University has one of the highest um, levels of new migrant communities in the world. It's highly concentrated. It's actually where I uh, grew up. It has a huge area of um, dispossessed uh, minority working class kids. And Western Sydney University, despite being in this area, really has focused on research knowledge translation for social impact. Um, so anyway, we decided to design a project. We had some friends that worked for Microsoft, the enemy, um, and um, we decided to design a project to think about disability for kids from minority background parents, so culturally and racially marginalised, and kids with quite profound intellectual and physical disabilities. 
And we started that project just before the pandemic in 2019. It was Australian Research Council project. And we actually had full support of Microsoft because most of you don't know, but Microsoft, all of these companies really, they don't really have anywhere to go in terms of communities who have money. And if you think about GDP spending on care services, disability is one of the big ticket items in national first world economies for care services. Uh, partly I know this, I'm gonna give my uh, team a plug. We have a special issue coming out in the Journal of Sociology that's looking at the digitization of the welfare state and access and stigmatization and discrimination. If anyone's interested in that, thinking about uh, the ways in which the state utilizes different structures of AI, everyday tech, and also AI, AI through automated decision-making. And so in this project, actually, what we did is we decided, okay, we're going to think about the ways that people from culturally and racially marginalised communities in low-income areas of New South Wales or Sydney, Western Sydney, actually utilise digital technologies because they're actually denied disability services. And actually what we found is that um, many of these kids who were streamed into special classes, streamed into um, uh, inclusive units, so separated, had low levels of education, actually used everyday technologies to mediate uh, Australian social, cultural and political life on behalf of their parents. So whilst they went to school and were told at school, uh, you know, they're going to have very le low learning grades, we actually found that some of them were on Facebook in Arabic, in English and in French, communicating to their families, even though they lived in a group home, in all three languages. We actually found when we did a book launch, so what we did over a two-year period, we took their stories about how they used everyday technology and then we worked with them over a two-year period to turn those into comics about their experience with everyday technologies and what that meant for them. We learned that some of our um, people that we were working with that were diagnosed as having high levels of autism actually could um, speak not just Vietnamese and English, but they had taught themselves on Duplo to actually speak Japanese. In fact, they had utilised online frameworks in Japanese to join anime groups and actually where their brothers and sisters would take them were to anime parties. They were all dressed up and no one knew that they had autism. And the only way they could connect through these to these groups was through everyday digital technology. Now, the reason why Microsoft is interested in this is because uh, people with disabilities are going to be the next large market in everyday technology. Most breakthroughs that have come through um, everyday technology have actually come from all of the engineering that's been invested for almost 100 years in disability assistive tech. So the fact that you can now expand your screen so you can read it or you can flip from having white text to a black background. That all comes from the engineering that was specifically designed to enable people with vision impairments to engage in, in technology. Not technology ever designed for you initially, but actually specifically designed for them. So this is a big, big area. And I think one of the things is... Um, uh, and when we think about, I guess, when we think about migration, so for me, coming back to migration, what does that mean? One is if we think about eugenics and the way that's embedded in migration, most of these kids, if they were born off-site, would never have been allowed entry into Australia because the statistical formula assumes that they will never have any kind of capacity or productivity to contribute to the Australian economy. But fortunately, when they were born, their parents were already Australian citizens. But they have actively contributed to the economy in, in Australian social life by enabling their parents to engage with the state. To engage with the state, they help their parents navigate how to get to different places using digital technology. They translate for their parents in ways, even though everybody assumes that they actually don't have the capacity 
but actually they're very, very savvy at, ha at hacking everyday tech. And I think what would be great is to really understand how very marginalised groups who don't have access to these, um, who, who don't have access to services even after they arrive, particularly around health and disability services, how they hack digital technologies in ways that are affordable, accessible, and create community di dialogue and belonging, not just for their families, but also exploring their own identities, where they've actually been highly marginalised within their, their new home country. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, you know, for our esteemed panelists here. And I've heard many um, things here that actually show that digital technology can improve quality of life. Um, it's not good enough for people to survive. It's actually like, Karen, what you're talking about is young people with disabilities can actually create, you know, the kind of belonging and life that, you know, that will increase uh, how they actually experience life. And that is actually very important. Uh, as we talk about technology and in the health area, precision medicine, individualized, you know, healthcare become the dominant discourses. The one thing that baffled me sometimes is as if all this technology are happening in a vacuum, but it isn't. And if the technology is there to improve health, what does health mean? Does that mean it's going to improve the sense of being, belonging, experiences? Or are we only talking that they're going to fix certain cells in my body so that I don't feel certain something? And so this is something that is really uh, exciting and for us to discuss. And I think that what I would like to hear from all of you is how does, so and Andre, you talk about uh, social determinants of, you know, digital access, right? Digital technology. So how do we see digital technology actually in the larger structure of the social determinants of health and also social inclusion? And the one thing that keep on, you know, coming to my mind as I listen to all the amazing ideas and, and our discussion is, how does advanced capitalism, our ongoing colonial structural violence, and really syst systemic, interpersonal, and structural racism fit into all these things? And sometimes we don't hear that with digital te technology because the AI semi-god is up there and we're just so interested in the technological part. So start with you, Andre. Yeah, no, thank you. So um, I was joking with uh, uh, my kids uh, not so long ago when I was giving instruction to my AI tool. You can't understand my accent. I had to repeat myself five times. I don't understand. I asked my son, can you say my son? say, oh, yeah, I understand. Because my son was born in Australia. So clearly you can see the AI is what I call um, driven by linguistic dominance. And that linguistic dominance, which means that I will need to change my accent, work hard to change my accent for that AI to be able to understand me. Now, if I'm using it to organize a medical appointment, I will never get my own medical appointment because it's telling me I don't understand you, you have an accent. So whether I have somebody now to call somebody to come to assist me to speak on my behalf, I'm disempowered, I'm able to speak on my behalf, but the AI doesn't allow me to to carry that agency, personal agency. So uh, another example then, which means what I've been terming now, what I'm still writing, having published a paper, what I'm calling the macroaggression self-training. Because if the AI forces me to train my accent to be able to be understood, I see that as a macroaggression, a macroaggression so an entity-driven macroaggression forcing me to change my identity, to change who I am, to be able to interact with ADT. So as a migrant, that's where I'm coming. That's my first point of, say, hang on here. What's happening here? Now, then when you look at the migrants who are not as fortunate as me to be educated, who can speak English, 
then you find that they need someone even to be able to show them how to log in on a computer. Most, most migrants will rely on their children to be able to log on a computer, which means then the, the, the whole issue of privacy as a father, as a mother, I no longer have a privacy. I rely on my child to access my personal information to be able to interact with ADT. That becomes a challenge. Then you have the issue of the fear of being victim of, of, of scammers because the issue of privacy and security is a serious issue among migrants. A, a fear of my details being stolen is so, so big that they would rather not interact with ADT if that means losing their um, private information or their privacy. So in other words, I'm a stronger believer for ADT being able to improve health outcomes, improve access uh, to, to uh, services, to improve the free living, improve quality of life. Generally speaking, yes. But when you look at it through an equity lens, the consequences are far greater outweigh the benefits within a multicultural society. So as we speak about ADT, we need to be able to push policymakers to think about how ADT will not only amplify, but also exacerbate health inequities. And I was even joking uh, later on, I was discussing one of my colleagues, when we look at the data quite available, I'm not an expert in ADT manufacturer, manufacturing, but when you look at the available simple data that exists is the current ADT development is costing almost $1.2 trillion worldwide, but 75% of those trials are failures. So which means only 20% are really pushing to the success, which means then it's become too expensive by the time it's on the market, too expensive because they need to recap their money, then to recap there. Now telling them about equity lens when they say we spend a trillion of dollars and we've failed many times. So we need to start thinking about how do we overcome the economic argument? How do we start uh, overcoming the, the drive for tra digital transformation for, uh, to build a nation while a big section of the nation is being left behind? How do we lift those being left behind to come to join the mass so that they are not being left behind within this digital age and as we move forward. I think that's where I'm at. Thank you. Um, so maybe Marla, I invite you to also comment on this because you talk about how during the pandemic, you know, great things happen. So you had online services and all that, except it's used by people from the urban area. So I'd like you to comment on the equity part too. Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. No, um, and and that's I think also an example of uh, where, you know, um, there's good intention. The policy was meant to uh, improve access by rural residents, but then it just did not work out that way. Uh, I think there was that intention, but of course there was a lot more that was needed. And I think in the case of ADT, as we often say when we have conclusions in the social sciences that it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. And how to make it sufficient will take a lot more in terms of uh, political will, in terms of institutions that we are building, and of course, in terms of the policies that we are making as well. And in some ways, um, with the, again, the example that was given by Andre, I was reminded actually of uh, Filipinos uh, working abroad and, um, when they are not able to access, and I think this became also quite apparent um, during and after the pandemic, when they could not access um, medical support or healthcare from where they are, then the possibility of accessing healthcare from Philippine providers was made possible. And in some ways you could look at it as, you know, like, uh, okay, that's a positive way because then they could access healthcare in a way that is culturally acceptable, uh, also emotionally um, acceptable to them because maybe they feel a lot more comfortable speaking with another health provider in the same language. But it also makes you question, uh, what about uh, you know, being able to access healthcare where they are? So I think that still remains a question. So the issue of capitalism or um, how 
technology interfaces with health um, is, is one that um, intrigues me a lot because a lot of the new technological approaches to health and healthcare, especially for young people, um, they're monetized. Most of those technology decisions are not being invested in by governments. Um, it's usually that, what do they call that? The, the public-private partnerships, the triple Ps. And so I've seen this, this operating um, in, in places in Canada where bringing in TELUS or Google or other folks to develop health solutions to increase access, but they're only doing it because there's a profit motive there. And so part of the issue becomes, where's the money and what is it doing? Um, so I, I think about for young people, um, we've actually used things like gaming, um, online games to gamify health promotion strategies because that's pretty effective. But a lot of the apps that are being created for healthcare or for health diagnostics or for gamifying health promotion also have either ads or data capture that is then being used by the corporate sponsors to access this population because there's profit to be made. This is in part perhaps why there's a gap when it comes to migrant populations, because there may not be as much profit. But, but the other piece of it is, how does that drive where our priorities are in our healthcare? I'm reminded that UBC, as, as an institution, has a very large international student population. And I was part of a conversation a year or two ago maybe even longer now, goodness, pre-COVID, um, where we were brought into a conversation with um, some, some tech folks who wanted to provide some additional support for health and healthcare access for students on, on campus. And um, some engineering colleagues, because I'm in the Faculty of Applied Science, which is nurses, engineers, and architects and community and regional planners were really a fun group to kind of interact with. So they were at the table and the VP of student services was there and these folks came and they wanted to pitch that what they would do is do a blood test of every one of the students coming in to the school or to the university, like just first blood test and do full genome scan and, and genetic health stuff. And that would solve the healthcare issues. And I'm thinking, um, STIs, sexually transmitted infections, colds and flu, stress and mental health stuff, not gonna find it in your genes. Now I will say the engineer in the group was like, oh, cool, yeah, this would be like so cool technologically. And someone else was like, Ooh, who's going to like use that data for what kind of commercial purposes in addition to diagnosing potential risk for certain health issues? So, and, and I was kind of like, uh, excuse me, I'm not sure it actually meets the health needs that most adolescents and young adults are coming to their student health services for, but also health eth ethics, privacy, human rights, um, have we thought about or talked about this? And, and I'm reminded of my tech colleagues who say, you know, if the app is free, you're the product. Um, your data and your information is what's being um, accessed here. So, so as we develop some really innovative approaches to health promotion, health diagnosis, healthcare access, even healthcare treatment, a key question when it comes to the advanced digital technologies and the digital solutions is, is it monetized and how and who's benefiting at whose expense?
Thank you, Elizabeth. And Karen, maybe you can comment on that too, because you work with the digital part and as well as the, the structural and determinants. Yeah, so this is a really interesting conversation for me from multiple aspects. And I guess one of them is coming back to eugenic science and the whole mode of statistics. Let's think about statistics, let's think about medicine and how they're grounded in these long standing notions of ableism and racism that um, come from Galton standing on the street, um, rating women, whether they're reproductive or not, in his pocket and then expand at this global scale. Clearly, they've become more sophisticated over this time, but we need to think about um, what is the basis of this technology, the kind of biases that it entails, and the way that it drives particular forms of decision-making around access and equity. A perfect example of this is in relation to the process of triage. Now, I don't know how many of you have studied disability in any way, shape or form, but what we know from the global pandemic is people with disabilities, when they rocked up to emergency with COVID, they were the last to receive any kind of medical care because the way that those rankings, scaling and measuring who is worthy of getting medical intervention in time of crises. Well, people with disabilities are more likely to die or they're gonna be more expensive to deliver service to. With the rollout of vaccines, even though they are more vulnerable to actually um, get dying or acquiring a second or third disability, they were often the last to have access to vaccines. And this is all based on statistical modeling which is often caught up in these processes and analysis of the state deciding who gets what healthcare when. So for me, it comes back to thinking about these underlying assumptions in the way in which these systems of digital information, digital technology are built um, and the kinds of biases they produce. The other thing I think, um, as someone who really has worked with AI and automated decision making around these kinds of decisions, particularly frontline care decisions, and you can read the plethora of papers coming out in the Journal of Sociology from across the globe, from India, the States, looking at Medicaid in the States and the way that it's, they're using a labor, um, Alexandra um, Matasusis, one of our contributors, writes about made in the US and Medicaid in the US and how Medicaid actually is using a labor surveillance device to measure care workers and their time and the quality of care that they provide while simultaneously using that data to not only surveil workers, but actually decide if the disabled person is actually getting too much care. So implementing practices of, of austerity within the kinds of statistical models that it devises to facilitate the work of the healthcare labour market and the way that services are delivered in the home. So I think, um, you know, for me, this is the thing about digital technology. It is this spectrum, this massive spectrum when we think about healthcare. And we need to think about like, who are the different players? So what is the role of the state? What kinds of contracts do they have with these people who are developing these uh, technologies, both for the individual who actually utilizes these technologies to maintain access to health and well-being? So, you know, often there is a disconnect between what you feed in on the platform of your hand and how that gets processed at the state. The clearest example of this uh, that we know, if we think about digital technology, accessibility and um, community wellbeing. If, I don't know how many of you know about Australia's robo-debt scandal, where it was automated matching between um, welfare debt and wages earned for the most poorest of, of people in Australia. Many people committed suicide because of the rapid release of these debts. Human oversight was gone. Within a week, they could issue 20,000 letters uh, many people died and actually in the end it was found illegal and the state had to pay back over $1.1 billion of illegal collected debt 
through AI processes. So these people might have been well, but actually through these processes, they became very unwell and required access to health and health care. And some of that was actually the data that they entered on the platform from their mobile device and then that, how that generated other forms of information centralised in the state. So I guess in terms of equity, um, to me, what, we're, what we really need to think about health equity is we need to look at the most squeaky end of our population and how do they engage with it? What are the outcomes for that group? And that tells us really if there is va value, excuse me, to a particular technology or not within this kind of or particular context and setting. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, so we had heard many stimulating food for thoughts, and I think this is a good time for us to open up to any questions in the audience and as well as online. The circulating microphones. <laughs> Yeah, I, I heard this uh, very, uh, you know, informative uh, discussion, but it is, you know, common semantic topics, you know, the access to a L1 digital technologies, you know, by different vulnerable group, you mentioned that racialized, low income, uh, LGBTQ and uh, newcomers and so on, you quickly add up, right, different dimensions. Uh, so, you know, this, certainly, you know, this is kind of, you know, sometimes we call double whammy effect or triple whammy or quadruple whammy. So you quickly run up the degree of freedom, I guess. Uh, so in, in that case, you know, it's, I think it's very important to look at uh, you know, the access to those kind of uh, uh, ADT and also internet and, and so on. And some even don't have mobile phone, you mentioned at the beginning. So, uh, so the issue here is that, of course, you know, uh, some may choose not to use those kind of, right? That's by choice. But at least you give people the option, right? So yesterday I make uh, you know, kind of controversial uh, comments on the government should actually put in more investment to build our infrastructure, uh, including AI and, and one digital technologies, uh, because we are doing that complement with our human capital we brought in, the immigrants uh, uh, population, then you know they are struggling in labor market, but also struggling in accessing you know social services, including uh, healthcare. So that's the reason why we are further falling behind in productivity on my other things, right? You know, uh, in, the, in the 80s, our, you know, U.S., Canada pro productivity ratio uh, is about 88 percent. No, it's, uh, you know, as of 2022, is only 71 percent. So meaning that our standard of living is falling even more behind, uh, in part, I guess, because the uh, immigrant uh, labor is not, you know, fully utilized, and also because their uh, health condition. We all heard about those kind of healthy uh, immigrant phenomena, right? Because our screening system. Uh, but you know, after that, you know, the um, the health status, you know, is, is definitely, you know, declining, right? And in part, maybe because the access of the healthcare system and uh, also with the assistance of ADT, uh, probably further in increase the inequality. So I think that's, you know, certainly, uh, you know, warrants a lot of uh, public policy discussion and debate uh, in this country. So who would like to respond to that about tying public policy and structural issues back into the ADT and productivity, which, need to be sociologically defined at another conference. I'm happy to give it a shot, but uh, uh, look, f from, again, for me, I, I talk about migration, so I, I wouldn't call myself an economist. But when you look at ADT and you look at its impact on social and health outcomes among migrants, we need to think about what I call the triple A plan. And the triple A plan, which should be the tool of any public policymakers are based on three different principles. Number one, A, is access, access to ADT. So one example to, uh, to, uh, to augment access to ADT, for example, among migrants, is 
to provide subsidized, subsidized um, internet provision, for example, because most of them are living in a high rise uh, in public housing with low internet penetration, with low in-house internet connectivity, etc. So, being able to have a, a, a policy, a national policy that subsidizes access to internet to be able to give migrant access to those infrastructure, that could be one example. However, access does not translate into adoption because that's a mistake we make. Having access does not necessarily mean they're going to adopt. Uh, the only way then we can start promoting the, uh, the, the adoption, there is what we call the, the, the free framework, one which is to create what we call cultural capital. And the cultural capital should include what we call digital community, uh, uh, community uh, brokers. You need to have uh, the digital community, um, to have a digital community testimonies. We need to build what we call the digital citizens, the digital citizen who will be like people to educate migrant population about safe use of EDTs, how to use EDT safely uh, without being exploited, et cetera. So that will be one framework. The other uh, framework will be around, uh, of course, building what we call bridging the intergenerational gap in digital literacy, because we are living in intergenerational houses where big, large families, we have parents who don't know how to use digital technology. You have younger who are experts in everything to do with the, the digital. And that intergenerational gap is creating not only conflict within the families, driving even a big section of the family away from using ADT. So bridging the intergenerational gap in digital literacy could be one example of driving adoption. And the last A, which is about, you can have access, you can adopt, it doesn't mean you are going to act on it, which is acting on once you have access, you have adopted, then you can take action. Do you have the agency to utilize the knowledge, digital knowledge you've acquired, to be able to utilize the access we have to take actions that may improve your health and well-being. So that's the triple A action that will be used by public, may vary by country because of the political reality. Like in Australia, it becomes a challenge because uh, Australia is a federal, federal structure and at each level of a, the, the structure, there are some responsibilities. For example, when we look at how health is funded, it's uh, through uh, what we call the horizontal fiscal equalization in Australia which means the money we pay in GST will go to the, to the state based on inequalities. And the first study I produced in 2020, 20, 2004 managed to force the federal government to accept migration as a source of inequity, which is building in that equation, which means then state with a lot of migrants get a lot of money. Now it's up to the state to invest that money into those AAA action. So now the argument whose responsibility is, whose role is, that where the politics comes more complex than you think. Thank you, Andre. So it sounds like we have to have new ways of thinking about monetizing. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, circulating microphone. Thank you for the panel and for all the interesting points. I wanted to come back to, I think, what Karen was saying at the end about how do you design a system thinking about the weakest link, I guess? Um, and how do you design a system for migrants to access these technologies in healthcare, thinking about migrants with the weakest status, uh, I would add. And, and here I would come back to what Andre was saying when you were talking about all the potential challenges that people have, and you were talking about some people feeling afraid of using these uh, with regular status, feeling afraid of using them because they're afraid of scammers. And I would add in for reflection that people who have um, vulnerable status or irregular status who have access to healthcare um, already feel um, afraid of using the access that they might have by law because they fear that, that their personal data will be transmitted. 
Um, we already know in, that there's almost nine countries in the EU that allow undocumented children the same level of access by law as citizen children. With their parents in those countries, without any question about technology, they're already afraid to go and bring them to, the, to, to get that healthcare access. So I guess the, the question is, how do we add another dimension that we, can, we have to be worried about what personal data can be used by private companies, but also by governments, um, and that there should be firewalls so that migrants' personal data can't be transmitted um, for immigration enforcement purposes. But it also kind of brings in these more ethical questions of how do you design these systems to make sure that that status issue isn't overlooked, um, even though they might be not the biggest group, there's still a lot of questions around it. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And we're going to, since it's warming up the questioning, we'll go to another one here, another question, and then a third question, and then the panel will discuss. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting panel conversation. Um, I have one remark and two questions. One is, um, Andrea, I hear you about the inequities, but it is also true that in places like Australia, Canada, or the US that select by skill, actually what we have found in a research that two colleagues who are at the back, Masood, uh, Kiampur, and Stein Montero have led, is that the people who come to Canada have equal levels of digital engagement, you know, use of social media, use of technologies. So I think what you were pointing out is that Actually, we say migrant. What does even migrant mean? There is, uh, you know, a lot of intersectionality um, in there. But my question to, I think, to you all is: a, if you were to have learned a lesson from COVID nineteen and the special crisis that it provoked, what would be your most important, most useful lesson in relation to to the use of advanced digital technologies for providing access to? to healthcare, whether proactive or uh, reactive. And second, for instance, because we referred a lot to Australia and we have to people, but also, for instance, I know very well the, the, the work of uh, Marla Assis and the Scalabrini in the Philippines and transnationally. What can we learn from each other? Uh, what, what are the, I don't know, the good practices, for instance, that we could transfer from, say, Southeast Asia to North America or from North America to I don't know, um, the Asia Pacific. Thank you. So we do have three questions here on my paper. So I'll get all of you to respond. Well, I'll start with the question around ensuring or, or talking about sort of the weakest or the most vulnerable populations and, and the challenge of access to care and where that data could potentially be used um, for for things beyond health and, and healthcare treatment. Um, and I would say that actually before we even get to the technology piece, we've got a healthcare professional and social contract piece that needs to be addressed. Unfortunately, that data doesn't necessarily just go somewhere. It usually is because somebody flags it. I know in, in some of the work that I've done in the US, um, clinically, I used to work with um, um, in, in night clinics with homeless and, and unhoused young people, many of whom were undocumented. And um, we would not actually do sort of data collection because they, they would give us a totally false name. They would like all of these things because they were so afraid of the system and, and being um, potentially connected. And we recognized because we heard lots of stories from them and I hear the same in, in Canada of people trying to access health systems and nurses and physicians and other healthcare workers at the point of care deciding to become cops and reporting them to whoever um, because of their migrant status or because of some other aspect of things and taking it upon themselves, which violates our ethics, by the way, you know, our codes of ethics do not allow that. Um, but so part of it is how do we actually provide the education and socialization of our health professionals to ensure that they're using the data 
in the appropriate way? And then how do you actually ensure that the programmers and the data systems within the health systems have the appropriate security? We're getting better at that. I mean, most people who are working in healthcare systems are now being like the, the nurses and, and others are being monitored. When you access somebody's, you know, someone tries to access Princess Kate's medical records, they will know and you will be contacted if you're not one of their direct providers. Um, so, so we have some of those surveillance technologies for health professionals already in place. And we have some of those firewalls that are beginning to be in place in some places. But that question about the extent to which people can trust, and they've got some really good reasons not to trust that aren't just about the technology, but the human user interface. Damn it. Sorry. Um, I think it's in my experience in working with people with classified as having quite profound disabilities from very new migrant communities. Um, it's slow. You know, it took me two years for them to write a comic book using AI about their everyday experience. But, you know, it's good. You learn a lot. You learn about what safe practice, what provides them with security, what's learning, what's reaffirming in the design, um, it's actually worth it. If you go, it's got to be a long, slow process. I mean, this is where, you know, the whole neoliberal state and the capitalisation, well, I mean, one of the problems that states have is they actually don't have the in-house skill to have design teams to work with highly vulnerable communities that could, we could really, really learn from in these design processes that would provide real, real opportunity to separate out data that's needed and data that's not. So if you speak to most people with disabilities, actually most of them are so sick to death of providing, you know, when you've got a disability, people know about your life. You go to the GP, they know everything about you. You go to school, they know everything about you. Actually, some of the good things about ADT is you, is you can provide, put limits on how much you can actually give. And if you're a disabled person, that's pretty attractive. The other thing that's pretty attractive for these vulnerable groups is they are so judged so often. So actually having a platform with no judgment where you can upload some basic information and get an answer um, that's a really positive and reaffirming experience. A, you got the platform right and you can use it. But B, this machine isn't asking me for unnecessary details so I can get treated. So there are uh, massive posit positives for the most marginalised who are constantly required. I mean, new migrant communities are constantly required to give that data over. And I even know as a middle-aged lady who comes to Canada in December and all of this, suddenly all these tests are flown at me and it's like, oh my God, who am I giving all my bio data to? And why do they want me to give all these tests? And, you know, I've got four degrees and I'm educated and yada, yada, yada. And, but if I was a disabled person, A, the data I would have had to provide before I even got through. And actually I have a, my biological daughter is non-white. So even when we went through the scanners in Sydney for the biometrics to get into Canada, she had to do everything twice. So um, I think, I think though in my, so my experience has been post personal and professional. And my view is there are really people who are very, very vulnerable do like ADTs for the fact that the human judgment about your worth and value is gone when you and you can get what you need when the questions and the design is right. It's really about the design and it's about acknowledging that's going to be a long process and it requires you know, the public need to value that. And with coming a, a moral or normative judgment around that value, then we have to, it's our job, as someone was saying before, to place pressure on the state to deliver the resources that are required for that design 
that not only emerges once, but actually is actively learning from the people who are engaging in that process. But it takes time. So this is part of the contradiction of ADT. Everybody wants a rapid answer because that's what it promises, but to get good design that's inclusive, respectful and dignified, because we're talking about dignifying people's lives, then that takes time. Thank you so much, Karen. And maybe Mala and Andre, you can quickly comment on lessons learned from COVID-19 and what have we learned from each other across all the different nations. And then we'll go to the online questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think one lesson that um, we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic is really the importance of health. Because even migrants themselves, uh, you know, based on interviews with them, it's like health is not really a priority. You know, uh, when we ask migrants, for example, how long do you think you will keep on working abroad? And they'll say, as long as my health allows me to. You know, so uh, I think it's the appreciation of health as a very special kind, I guess, of human capital that uh, we all have to take care of and uh, that we are responsible at different levels uh, as individuals and, of course, uh, as members of our society. And I think uh, one thing that came out also of the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, on, the parts, on the part of governments uh, is also the need to extend um, and amplify the health insurance you know, for migrant workers. Thank you. And uh, uh, from my point, uh, to answer the first question from Anna, what did you learn from the pandemic? Uh, the, the, the biggest learning, uh, um, as far as I'm concerned, was the rapid uh, adoption of um, digital technology. So all the studies, I don't know how many of you have read the McKinsey report, so when you look at the McKinsey report, it's showing that the, the pace of the adoption of digital technology was equal, regardless whether you are developed or developing countries. So in Canada, in USA, so the, 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 the pandemic accelerated the adoption of digital technology by four years in Canada, by four years in USA, by three years in Asia, and by three years in Africa. So in other words, the rapid adoption accelerated, so the pandemic accelerated the adoption of ADT at equal pace, but their impact varied differently, suggesting that the adoption of ADT will be always, its impact will be determined by the environment in which it's occurring. So that's the lessons I can say is across the board. Now, what can we learn from each other in terms of going forward is that whether you are in the Philippines, whether you are in Congo, where I come from originally, or whether you are from Australia, whether you are from Canada, if you are a migrant, you are seen disadvantaged. So migration and related inequities are omnipresent, regardless where you are. So which means then in whatever we do, maybe the question, Anna, I think uh, it's a good idea. We here as an outcome of this today conference, is more to come up with a document that could be able to show commonalities and differences in the adoption of ADT during the pandemic and post pandemic is, uh, uh, is uh, an outcome of this conference. That could be shown that it's not, personally I'm saying it will be silly of me or an individual to sit here to, to summarize this, this actually is something where we can be purposeful to try to collect views, I don't know whether during or post, to produce a document that can highlight commonalities and differences in bridging migration-related inequities during and post the pandemic. That would be a fantastic document that we could use to show as an outcome of a conference and for funders. Thank you, Andre. And to the people who are practicing digital technology, we must not ignore them. Questions from the audience online? Um, oh, I guess one just came in. Any ideas on how ADTs can help bridge the gaps in access to healthcare for temporary foreign workers under the TFWP, whose reality um, is fear of being returned, excludes them from access to healthcare? Great. So, Mala, can you answer that?
Thank you. Uh, I think um, one way to address that issue is uh, maybe to have some kind of a migrant health hub uh, where migrants from different uh, country, which migrants from different countries can access. And it's a kind of hub that would also provide uh, services in various languages and where um, privacy and confidentiality of information is a uh, principle that would be honored. So that would also help um, address some of the concerns about, uh, you know, being reported in case uh, their status is not a good one. Yeah, thank you very much. So we have come to the end of this conversation. And of course, we can continue with this. And as Andre already said, we need to not only have access and adopt, we have to act. So Andre had invited us to do something. So I hope that this conversation continue and we will do something. And we appreciate that you're all here and feel free to reach our uh, scholars and researchers here and talk to them more about the issues that we had discussed. Thank you very much. <laughs>